Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture, which was given to me as a, uh, a uh, smarter cities question. Uh, and you're going to find that I'm going to wander around that and take that actually quite liberally. Um, I've been here uh, last week and this week and next week teaching in, in the systems thinking course in the Creative Sustainability Program. So, when you say urban systems, I actually take it pretty seriously on the system side. So um, I decided to give this talk um, to be a little bit authentic uh, to my background because I was involved with the Smart Cities program at IBM um, quite a lot around uh, 2008 to 2010. And uh, as I started thinking about um, what I should be talking about, uh, I came to appreciate that probably everyone here has heard about smarter cities but doesn't actually know what that means. Like, like every, and every time you hear it, you kind of go around and so I thought, well, okay, I'm going to take a different approach. So um, you'll find that I'll be wending in and out of my career. I, uh, I, I've been here back and forth at uh, Alta University, uh, I'll take University of Technology since 2003. <laughs> Originally, I came here uh, with a friend, uh, David Hawk, at, to teach a class. And um, they said they liked me, so they asked if I could come teach. And I said, that'd be fun. And David said, while you're here, you might as well finish your PhD. And then uh, the program I was in no longer existed after a year, so I became this very strange PhD student. So um, that's, that's wending its way through this. Also, uh, the, um, uh, I retired from IBM in 2012. Uh, so I, I've been with IBM 28 years, um, and i um, been working with a, a small business and trying to start it up. Uh, and trying to finish my PhD at the same time. But I still keep very much in touch with IBM, and what I've discovered over time is that when I read things from IBM, I read them and I understand them in a way that people other don't. So um, the, talk of the, the talk is going to be um, what I call systems co-evolving because there's a lot going on in the same time. And in some respects, the history of science talk, and then it goes up into the future. So I'm going to talk about um, system sciences, I'm going to talk about service sciences, I'm going to talk about how smarter it fits in all this, and then I'm going to go a little bit into the future and talk about cognitive systems and cognitive computing. So some of you were uh, assigned, if you're in the class I guess, to, to look at this article, um, Rethinking System Thinking, Learning and Co-Evolving of the World. Uh, this is probably the, the best capsulation of where I was about 2011-2012. And in essence, the issue that I saw with systems thinking is that the world in systems thinking, people tend to be back in the 1960s and 1980s. Now this means it's kind of pre-internet, even pre-personal computer type people telling you how the world is supposed to be. So my major concern has been, what is system thinking doing now and what are people that are in the field doing today? And it's quite a, a change from that. Uh, instantly the slides I'll have posted on my website and I'll, I'll show you where to get them at the end. Uh, here's the agenda, and it's um, sort of this way in a, a strange way because uh, the left side is me and the right side is IBM. When you've been with IBM 28 years, it's really hard to rub the blue off. Um, and so I started off doing work in the system sciences, and then um, in, in, um, at the uh, 2003, no, it was 2005 meeting of the International Society for System Sciences, Jim Spohr from IBM came and spoke, and that was when they were starting up the idea of service systems, management, engineering, and design. Um, then uh, a number of us in the systems community picked up on that and started working on service system science. Uh, there's this drift through smarter planet and smarter cities that I'll talk about, and recently IBM has shifted towards a cognitive era. <clears throat> and I think you're going to find that part interesting and challenging because there's new opportunities that happen. I'll talk a little bit about the service system thinking research that I've been doing on the side um, when I'm not busy. So I'm going to go way back, um, way back to the Roman Empire. And the reason for this, as part of the system's work, um, a lot of the things that I've been looking at in, in systems have been, have been about expansion and collapse. 
And there was a book that came out uh, by Joseph Tainter called The Collapse of Complex Societies. Uh, the more I've been reading, there's been an update, there's a, uh, a book um, that came afterwards uh, in, in partnership with uh, uh, Timothy Allen, who is also a president of the International Society for System Sciences, where he looks at it a little bit differently and actually extends some of the work. So the question that Tim Allen asked is, um, the Roman Empire started off and it expanded, and then it collapsed. Uh, and when it collapsed, it actually went and it kind of went to two sides. The first is you have the, Ro the Western Roman Empire, and then you have the Eastern Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire actually was the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire lasted for a lot longer. So it lasted like to, you know, 10, 1025 at peak. And then, so it lasted a lot longer. And so the question is, why was that so? Um, and this, re this brings into a lot of questions then about uh, what is a complex society? What do you mean by collapse? Uh, what is a system? When you talk about an urban system or a regional system. In the work that, uh, that um, Tim Allen and Joe Tainter were doing, they say complexity in social systems refers to differentiation and organization or increasing organization. And the example they use in the book is uh, Dominguez Ruin, and this ruin is in um, southwest uh, Colorado. And he makes a point and talks about this ruin, 12th century AD, and the structure is small, simple, and undifferentiated. So, you know, expect 12 AD, then, you know, it's pretty primitive. And then he compares it to the Anasazi Heritage Center, which is right beside it. And so here's a modern, modern museum that is trying to explain the Pueblo, and it's so much more complex than the, sy than the system is trying to describe. And so he talks about it being, it requires a permanent staff and fleet of vehicles, the staff that are hierarchically organized and differentiated by specialization. So we're not just talking about the built structure here, we're talking about the social structure around it, the whole system of the people and the built environment together. Uh, the center is funded by the federal government, so when this was a Pueblo, it was sustainable on its own, but now it actually requires all these outside resources, uh, energy needed to heat and cool the water may exceed the entire prehistoric community consumed when it was occupied. So, what's going on here? Um, what, what do we, what's going on in this society? So I have to give you a brief uh, lecture on, on systems thinking and the definitions I use. This is kind of the mandatory stuff I have. Um, because my definition of system thinking, and you'll find I get very few definitions by, that are by me, I give other people's definitions. System thinking is a perspective on wholes, parts, and their relations. Wholes, parts, and their relations. So it's a very, very basic idea that applies across a lot of cultures, uh, applies in a lot of areas. And we have three ideas, essentially. We have function, which is contribution of the part to the whole, now this is one of the key things about systems thinking is you have the part and the contribution to a whole, so it's always a containing whole around it. You have structure, which is arrangement in space, and you have process that is arrangement in time. Now everyone, of course, uses all these words. We use the word system every day, we use process, we use function, and so here's the skill testing question. Which comes first, process or structure? Anyone brave enough to try? Which comes first, process or structure? I think structure because you cannot make a process if you don't have appropriate structure. Okay. Does anyone else have an opinion? Okay, I was with the System Society for about eight years before I was having a walk across the parking lot with someone and I asked him that question. He said, oh, it's obvious. I go, yeah, it's like really obvious. He says, process comes first. And the reason that process comes first is that structure is the slowest changing process ever. So to you, when you look at a mountain, you may see structure, but actually a mountain changes too. It all has to do with the perspective you have and when it, and when it changes. So with that, um, let me go to another detail, which is um, 
I also deal a lot with systems thinkers, a variety of systems thinkers, and every once in a while I run across one that says, oh yeah, I do system thinking too, and I talk to them and I go, wow, that's a really bad system thinker. They, they talk like they think they're a system thinker, but when you actually talk to them, they actually have no idea what they're talking about. So uh, the, the key for system thinking is synthesis precedes analysis. Synthesis is putting things together. Analysis is taking things apart. And the sequence matters because systems thinkers identify a containing whole system of which the thing to be explained is a part. So I already described the part. What is the whole that's contained in? So my favorite example of this is um, you're trying to get to school, you're trying to get on the tram, the tram's late, you get on, you're angry, and you yell at the driver, and it's like, actually usually isn't the driver's fault. There's a containing system in which that tram is involved. So you can think of a multiple containing systems because there is the transportation system as a whole, so it could be the traffic is bad. There's a financial system where funding is involved, so maybe they're underfunded and they don't send the trams as frequently as they should. There's a political structure, there's all these other containing holes. So not enough just to talk about the system. You also need to talk about the containing hole in which the system is contained. Secondly, explain the behavior or properties of the containing hole. Okay, we have the tram. So, what's happening in traffic? What's happening in politics? What's happening in financial circles, whatever? And explain the property of the thing to be explained in terms of role or function within the containing hole. Now you can go back in. And if there is, if there is not enough funding in the uh, system, perhaps the driver is grumpy. Um, maybe he's had a bad day, maybe the weather is bad. All these sorts of things play in. But the idea behind system thinking is to look towards a containing whole as opposed to looking at the part itself. Now I've been lecturing these last couple of days and um, the students in that class have been challenging, so here's some new ideas. Um, one is about, people talk about complex systems um, and complexity. And you might be a little bit careful on this. Uh, a lot of this work was done at Santa Fe Institute. So this is um, Melanie Mitchell from um, Santa Fe Institute who says, there is no generally accepted definition of complex system. Informally, a complex system is a large network of relatively simple components with no central control in which emergent complex behavior is exhibited. Okay. Well, it actually sounds more like a network to me than, than a... Um, uh, a system. A system has function. This has structure in space, has structure in time, but uh, you're, what you're saying that may or may not have function because you haven't identified the containing whole. So, okay. Um, let's see. Emergent complex behavior is tougher to define. Roughly, the notion of emergent refers to the fact that the system's global behavior is not only complex, but arises from the collective actions of the simple components and the, ma the mapping from individual actions to collective behavior is non-trivial. Now you get, when you're talking about systems, you normally get this issue where people start describing boundaries. So what is the system you're talking about? Are we both talking about the tram system? Are we talking about the automobile system? Are we talking about the transportation for the city as a whole? All these sort of alternatives come up, but we end up having to describe those. And then you can come and start working through, well, what are the properties, what's happening with it? Now, one of the things in the systems community is when we look at these things, sometimes it's not a matter of something inherent in the system, it's your perspective. So if you say the tram is the system you're interested in, then you start looking around that, um, then you could say, well, okay, am I looking inside the tram? So is it like the, the mechanisms, the wheels, the driver, uh, the way it's powered by through electricity or fuel or whatever? Um, or are you looking outside the tram? And so what happens when people start look, doing the network sort of thing? Network is more of a flat orientation, it assumes everything's at the same level. Whereas when you start talking about systems, you start introducing ideas of hierarchy, where things are contained inside each other. Now, why has, been, why has there been all of this interest in complexity science? Uh, complexity science, when you actually do some reading, the Santa Fe Institute was founded um, 
a uh, lot from the funding from Citibank, and they were interested in modeling um, financial markets and how derivatives work and all that sort of stuff. And so we ended up that in complexity theory, they tend to concentrate on simpler models that are more tractable to mathematics, and also the computers made it possible for the first time in history to make more accurate models of computers of complex systems. But the risk that we have when we start doing that is that, in, in effect, we're in the world of physics. And you're trying to model the world using all physics. In the community that I work in, the system thinking, system sciences community, we tend to think across all types of systems. So human systems, biological systems, mechanical systems, of course, ecologies. And so sometimes when you're working in the complexity sciences, it's actually limiting you from thinking about what you should be thinking about. Now, the students that were taking system thinking um, that I'm lecturing in other class got really upset because they come and now it's the second class of system thinking. And I say, you really know there's no such thing as systems, right? There's no such thing as a system. A system is something that human beings put on top of the world so they can understand it. More rigorously, this is um, uh, Robert Rosen's work. Um, my students are now nervous because they have to present on anticipatory systems. Um, but essentially the idea is that you have a natural system. There's a real world out there. And then you have a formal system, which is a model. And you create that model of the world. And, and it could, doesn't that be a formal model? If, like, if, if you're going to go to the point where you're actually going to start doing simulation work and, and stuff, it has to be computable. But people also talk about mental models, right? Things hang together. You kind of put these things all together. Uh, and so there's an idea of encoding and decoding, which is you take the natural system, you encode it into a formal model, and then you can actually decode it back. But those of you who see this kind of realize that if you actually took this and did a model of the world and then took it back, it wouldn't be the real thing, right? We aren't quite in the Star Trek generation of replicators where you could have living things and put them in the replicator, transport them, take them apart, and put them all back together again. We aren't in that world. Um, so this, this is the challenge we have when we're doing system thinking and doing, um, and doing work on modeling. Um, can we actually get enough in the formal models to move forward. Now Tim Allen, in doing his work, actually looks at complexity in a different way. And, and, but he does say that Rosen says that um, their complexity applies to things that cannot be modeled. Complexity applies to things that cannot be modeled. So why are people studying things if they can't model them? And he introduces the idea of complicatedness. Because complicatedness is actually something that you can model. It's complicated, it could take you time to do it, whereas complexity itself is actually inherently unmodelable. So now you've got this, now you're going around and going, how am I using the terms complexity and complicatedness? And am I using the word system right, using complexity right? That sort of happens when you start working around these ideas. So when you talk about urban systems, is it a complex urban system, or is it a complicated urban system you're working on? If it's a complex urban system, then you probably have what system people call a mess, a problematique, a wicked problem, right? If it's a wicked problem, there's no start, there's no end, there's no solution, but you have to do something, so you do something, and then something comes out later, right? You try to do the best you can, but there's no optimizing, there's no forecasting, if it's really complex. If you can represent it in a complicated fashion, that means you can actually take it apart and say, this, this is how things work together. Um, the issue you run into when you're going into the complicated is whether you've actually captured enough of the world to make the model useful or not. So if we can't work on models, can we actually work on, um, on complicated, uh, it can't work on complexity, you can work on the uh, complicated instead. And so um, Tim Allen says, complexity is a matter of having a paradigm. Do people here read uh, Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? Oh, oh, research methods. And people heard of the term paradigm shift. Okay, go okay. 
I think you guys have to assign some new readings to these people. <laughs> or get the idea. So essentially the idea is that science goes through waves. You have a period of normal science where uh, science advances incrementally, and then you have something coming in where there is a completely new paradigm. And what a new paradigm means is you're supposed to take all the old textbooks and burn them. Because everything in that textbook is now wrong. So we have Newtonian physics going on for a long time, and then Einstein comes along and is like, well, Newtonian physics doesn't work. You know, you just need something more general. We have this new model. Oh, okay, anyone that was uh, in Newton's age is now, you know, they burn those textbooks, right? So model, uh, within science, you have the idea of paradigm, and that's where all the models and all, everything hangs together. So if you don't have a paradigm, it's complex because you can't understand it. Uh, if you do have a paradigm, which, why, do you wanna, why do you want a model? You want a model to simplify the world, and what you have to do is, um, is, is work on understanding it, taking apart, analyzing it, maybe seeing how it works in the world. Um, but what happens is that, remember, this is not the real world. So he's, he brings up these ideas of hierarchy, constraint, uh, links that are large and small, fast and slow, um, and different types organization within the system. And he says, these are not part of complexity. These are part of being complicated. So we want to work on complicated stuff so we can actually understand things. So in the work he's done on supply side, supply side sustainability, he's introduced these ideas of complicated and, co and complex. Now, what does this mean? So remember we started off with the, uh, the Pueblo and the museum beside it, right? So we have, in effect, a low energy system. The Pueblo was a low energy system. And the museum today is operating on a high energy system. With complexity, you have elaboration of organization, which means you have going up and down, right? You have people working there. You have uh, uh, the... Um, hierarchy of, uh, of, of working on the electrical grid, the water comes in, the building materials, all those things are dependent on a certain level of civilization. Um, when you do this, and this is one of the strange things is, people complain about complexity, but complexity makes things simpler. You can't understand the inside, but you can understand the behavior. So one of my favorite examples of talking about complexity versus complicatedness is if you look at an Apple iPhone versus uh, at the way that Google does Android. So for anyone that's had Apple device, I don't know if people hate iTunes. Um, I can't stand iTunes because you know I spend money on this device and it won't let me do anything. Right? It only lets me do what Apple wants it to do. That is a complex because it is all integrated, it's all together, I can't take it apart. However, if you go into the Android ecosystem, it's a completely different design where there's hundreds of different vendors, all with Android devices, and there's all these apps, and you know, some of the apps fit together, and you can get parts, and you can actually you can make your own. You can hack your own um, in the operating system, because it's Linux-based, you can go all the way down to the bottom. That is a complicated system. On the outside, the Apple devices are simpler because they can hide all the complexity on the inside. However, if Apple ever goes out of business, that'd be an interesting proposition, there's gonna be a lot of devices out there with, that no one can use. Um, if Google goes out of business, what's interesting is that it's a Linux base, they're actually, they, they, they just come out, um, uh, Ubuntu is coming out with a tablet. So um, people don't quite have the paradigm yet because you used to have a, 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 um, a computer and then a, a tablet. Well, the new tablet that's coming out is a computer. Like you just add the keyboard and you have all the functionality that you have in Linux, all of it. Not just what's in Android, not just what's in uh, an iPhone device. You have the whole thing running on your tablet. Because what's the difference? It's all Linux, you know, they just build it differently. So there's, I, I know because I've been um, playing with this, you bought one of the original Nexus devices, so I have a Nexus 5, 
this thing runs Android, right? It's been updated, and I don't want to hack it because I actually use it. But on the other hand, I can actually load Ubuntu on this thing. It's complicated. It's complicated. I can replace the operating system on this device. On, on a Apple device, it's complex. You cannot replace the part. <laughs> and there's more recent work. Um, I'm having to work my way through this. Um, have any of you ever gone through the Panarchy model? Okay. The Panarchy model has been created in ecology and is an idea of potential and connectedness. Um, and what happens is it goes through a life cycle. Most people just like it for the figure eight, that you start off in the alpha state um, and you kind of go down through um, a garage, uh, that I usually use a uh, startup business sort of discussion. When you start off here, you've got um, high, uh, you've got high capital and low connectedness. So this is like a garage shop operation. What happens is that you kind of integrate that, you create your small business, and so you use up potential capital. Uh, you go through here and hopefully break out, and create a really wealthy company, and then the company dies and it goes through these cycles. When you're working through panarchy, um, there's actually multiple levels this could happen at. So when we're talking about, about systems, you can go up or you can go down. But that's a lecture in itself, so I'll leave it for Aya to cover some other time. <laughs> I'm going to change a little bit now because the talk was supposed to be about smarter cities. Um, and I'm going to go back through and, uh, and talk about the beginning of service science management engineering and design. So in uh, 2006, um, because we, we actually started in, uh, Jim actually started doing this around 2004, 2005, uh, IBM had this interesting, um, interesting thought, which was, okay, um, IBM had moved from being a hardware company to being a services company. You, people kind of know that now, you know, you don't see the IBM PCs around anymore. Um, if anyone's actually, if anyone, anyone ever seen an IBM time clock? IBM in the, uh, in the their, IBM, well, you guys, are, I, you, I, I'm too old now. When I was in primary school, you have all the clocks in the, all the classrooms, right? They used to be IBM clocks. And what they would do, could, they'd centralize it, so when you, you have to change the clocks, you know, 300 clocks in a school, you have one place, and like that's a computing device. But now we're back in the 1960s, right? So how do you how do you coordinate changing all the clocks all at once? So IBM had clocks, and moved beyond that. Um, anyway, so um, this this question came out: If IBM is moving where the revenue is like 50% services, um, how much was IBM spending on research into services? It's like, uh, like. 1%? Oh, okay. If half of your revenue is coming from services and 1% of your research is on services, should you do something about it? So they started this initiative called Services Science Management Engineering and Design. And it was an interesting proposition that IBM went to universities around the world and said, as an IBM, like this, this happened all the way up to the chairman's level. They would come and say to the university, the students you're graduating do not have the skills that IBM wants to hire. And the response was, okay IBM, tell us what you want. And we go, we don't know. You guys are smart, why can't you guys figure it out? Well, it turns out we had this problem before. It happened in the 1950s, 1960s. And, and we said, students that you're graduating don't have the skills that IBM wants to hire. And the math department says, oh, we do that. And we go, that's not it. The philosophy department says, oh, we do that. And say, that's not it. And then the engineering department says, oh, we do that. And they say, well, that's not it. So what was it? Computer science. If you were in the 1960s and you said you were doing computer science, people would go, there's no science in computing. There's electrical engineering. That's a real science. you know." And I, So that was the proposition at that time. And in 2006, there was this conference where they brought together um, 254 people representing 21 countries, government, industry, and academia to discuss this issue. Service economy, everyone moving towards service economy. 
what is it that people need to know? And so they worked on things like across all these. And um, uh, at the merger of Alto University from the three universities into one university, Jim Sporer was one of the people they brought in to advise at that time. So the idea that universities are not serving students sometimes, but they're not serving the companies either, it's like, wow, this is an interesting thought. But what's happening out there? So this is a study from 2007, and the way to read this is we have material and information, and we have products and services. And this is um, growth national product in the United States. And the way to read this is, if you are here in material and services, this is like General Motors. If you are here in information and services, this is Google. So what's happening is that this is moving and this is taking up bigger. So you know, Google is getting bigger, Apple is getting bigger, and General Motors is getting smaller. So if you're universities, you might actually want to pay attention to the shift in the economy and actually do something different. That led to some studies. Here's one from the um, Cambridge Institute for Manufacturing that was done with IBM. And it gave a definition, which is, a service system can be defined as a dynamic configuration of resources, people, technologies, and organizations, shared information. It uh, creates and delivers value through services. A uh, service system can be a complex system with interactions, interface between provider customers, customer customers, and suppliers. So that's, that's definition that's pretty good. Concretely, what does it mean? This is a list that Jim came up with that I found quite helpful. And uh, he, was, um, he was participating on a, uh, a study group uh, in Washington about what should we be having in primary school and secondary school if we're doing a service system. If we're moving towards service economy, it doesn't make sense to, to do something, something different. And so he created this categorization. Firstly, when uh, you start off your kids in school, you want to learn about systems that move, store, harvest, and process. Transportation system. First, they have to get them to school. So you know they learn about buses rather quickly. Uh, water and waste management. Well, you could teach them that the water just doesn't come out of the tap. It actually goes back, and uh, where that come from. Food and, and, gross, uh, food and global supply chain. You know, food doesn't just show up at the supermarket, it comes from farms. Energy energy grid, uh, by the time they're in grade four, they could probably manage their own mobile phone, but then it's like, how does a mobile phone work? What's really happening behind the scenes? Systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction. Now, this is the interesting part is building and construction is a service industry. And it's a huge service industry, and people don't appreciate that. Banking and finance, retail and hospitality, healthcare. Um, education, by the time you've gotten to grade nine, you're actually studying what it is you've been doing for the past nine years, right? Um, but uh, you get there. Uh, finally, systems that govern. So cities, you can start studying about grade 10 um, and read to the state to grade 11. And by the time you get to grade 12, you may have a chance of trying to under figure out how nations work, because they're most abstract. But in essence, this is what Jim suggested. It's, it's an interesting idea. Um, because it reorients the world to, you know, should we really be studying English and math and all these courses in the functional area, or should we actually take it and center it around these service ideas instead? It's a different way of looking at the world. There has been a lot of work already. Now, one of the big contributions of services, uh, this is actually work by uh, Richard Norman and Rafael Ramirez um, on on trying to think about services and value. Um, the way that most people think about value is it actually turns out to not be about value, it's about cost. Um, so when you actually like, do national accounts and gross domestic product, what they do is, well, you have the supplier, and then on top of that, they add some cost, and then the, co the customer adds a the cost, and they're willing to pay a little more for it. And that's what they think about it. But there's a different way of thinking about it with um, interactive value creation, where you have parties that are working together and it's interactions between the parties that creates value. So there's a little trick in the language here. You used to get into the discussion of co-production of outputs and co-creation of value. Uh, and these are systems-based concepts. So those uh, are the, 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 the people that are in service science there's some people that think systems and other people that don't. 
Uh, so you have to be a little careful with the language. What are the basic concepts of, of value? Um, and this is from uh, Jim Spore and Steve Kwan. So the idea of resources, uh, services, and entities. Um, access rights. Access rights are interesting in a service economy because you don't have to own it to use it. So certainly, when you go a little bit farther back, you could always rent a car. You didn't have to buy a car. You just had to have access to rent a car. But now if you look at services, you look at online services, you don't have to own all of the computing power in the world. You just have to have access to it. Value proposition based interactions. If you do this, I'll do that. Because you need to actually have um, a little bit of negotiation. Uh, one of the interesting um, sidebars to this is uh, Steve Heckel, who I worked with at IBM, talked about sense and respond and make and sell models. A make and sell model is like most production companies. A bus is a make and sell proposition. The bus runs on a schedule. The bus runs whether you are there or not. A taxi is a sense and respond system because you get in the taxi and the first thing the taxi driver asks is, where do you want to go? The taxi cannot move until you provide the information about where you want to go. You'll be sitting there a long time, you know. So you have this value-based um, proposition. Uh, governance mechanisms, here's what will happen if things go wrong. Um, this is interesting in the day of Uber. Why are taxis more expensive than Uber? And why, you know, if Uber had to do all of the things that taxis do, they may end up at the same price. There's a lot of things that happen in the regulations. Um, service system networks, how things all link up. Uh, the whole ecology of all of the big entities, stakeholders, measure outcomes. So these are sort of things that he thinks about in a service system. Now when you're thinking urban systems, should you be thinking about urban systems as services? Right? So I've, I've done a fair amount of work actually with, uh, with government. And uh, have you ever heard the expression of um, coin-operated government? Coin-operated government is for people that think, oh, you know, I pay my taxes and therefore I should get this proportion, right? So, I, I, I should get my garbage picked up because I pay for taxes. Oh, I don't have any children, so therefore I should not pay for education. That's what they call coin-operated. That's not the way governments work. They have funds and they have pooling and all sorts of stuff. You do things for the society. But they are service systems that you decide you're either going to have or not have. And they happen at different levels. Um, so uh, when I was working um, on Smarter City stuff with uh, some people in the region of Peel, just outside of Toronto, uh, generally healthcare is a provincial thing. Um, so normally you, you get, in the province of Ontario, uh, you get uh, free medical, but you do not get free dental, <laughs> and you don't get eye care. Well, this city decided they're going to have free glasses. They, were, they decided that for their citizens, they decided if the provincial government didn't provide optical services, that they were going to provide optical services. And it's kind of like, they can do that. They're a government. They can decide that's a service they want to provide. OK. Um, under these 10 basic concepts, you have the formal services, the formal um, system entities. These are legal entities. You have the informal ones, more societal relationships, open source is an example. And the idea that Jim had, um, he, he saw this starting, again, it started like 2005. Um, he wanted to see if we could develop a natural history of service system entities. So we have service systems all around us, we just haven't thought about them that way. But maybe we should look back, and so maybe it's not so crazy to be looking at the Roman Empire. You can ask, what services did the Roman government provide to the Romans, and are they still giving, giving those type of services today? Now, we talk about services. The way that it started off originally was science, improve the understanding, management, improving capabilities, engineering, improving control, and design, improving the experience. The idea was that services need to be approached completely differently because we are so product-oriented that we need to have all these fields change. 
Um, that was part of the hope in the Creative Sustainability Program that some of those barriers would have been broken down. Maybe in the Urban Systems course it can break down some of these barriers too. Okay, I'm going to switch back over a little bit because while all that, all the stuff I told you about service science is IBM stuff. Now, as an IBM employee, but I also have this other side going on, which is me as an academic. And my question is, is the thinking different across agricultural systems, industrial systems, and service systems? So let's just take a, a basic example here. So if you worked in an agricultural economy, you had a way that the system would work, um, the everyday life, and so, um, so say I'm coming out of the industrial economy and I'm coming at the beginning, so we're at the industrial revolution, we're right here, okay? And I say, okay, oh, well, Aya's a farmer, and uh, she's having, you know, I, I think I'd give you a better job, right? I see that in Finland it's really dark in, in uh, the winter, and so you, you end up waking up in the dark and, you know, it's cold outside and then, then when it gets to summer you work all day, like day you, and, and, the, and, the, and the day here is really long. <laughs> so, so it's like this is a really bad life, you know, and it's, and, and it's unpredictable. What I can do is offer you a job in a factory. We work 9 to 5, work Monday to Friday, you have the weekends off, and, um, you know, we pay fine and uh, I think you'd be comfortable. I says, oh, that's great. Uh, sounds pretty good. And I said, okay, why don't you come in? You start Monday morning, you start <coughs> nine o'clock. And you go, uh, I have to come to work in the dark then. And we go, yeah, we work nine to five. But then in the summer, you lose all that productivity. And you go, yeah, we work nine to five. The nine to five orientation that we have in the world is driven by machines. And so the real industrialists, the hardcore industrialists, would run the machines 24 hours and have three shifts, right? That's the way you run it. Now, if we move to a service economy, a service system, what's it mean to work in a service system, service economy? So as an IBM employee, which primarily working in services, um, one of the protocols was that um, they, they actually stopped tracking vacation at IBM. They stopped tracking vacation because when they actually did the studies and the surveys, they found out that most IBMers don't take all the vacation they're entitled to. And why would they do that? Well, it's just one of those things. Like, so, you know, your, 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 um, your phone rings like at 6 o'clock and your mobile phone rings. Do you answer or not? If you're in the industrial economy, it's like, no, the factory's closed. I don't answer my phone after 5 o'clock. But in the service economy, it's like everyone answers their phone. You, know, you can look at it, you can decide not to answer. But you, even then, you should look at it, who's calling, right? I want to know if it's my boss calling. If it's anyone else, or it's customer will answer, but no, no one else will put it down, right? So a lot of the presumptions we have about the way that we work and the way that we live that come from the industrial economy may or may not apply in the service economy. Covering the system scientists, we actually have a pretty good idea of, um, of Social system science. Um, some of you may have heard of the idea of socio technical systems. This is about work design. This is actually coming out of the coal mines in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. And a lot of what we know about the way that we design work came out of socio technical systems. Before that was socio psychological systems. Um, a lot of uh, men had come back from war that were, had uh, PTSD. Um, and there's also socio ecological systems view. And this is about how changes in the world start accelerating and how organizations respond to that. The question is, if we're to have a service systems perspective, how would we do that? And that's a long-term question. That's not something we're going to answer very quickly. We also have the idea of design thinking that's come up recently. Um, everyone knows about design thinking? You've heard of it? You've actually, actually seen a definition of design thinking? This is how people talk about design thinkers. People are designers. If you, if you come from a real design background, design thinking is not what designers do. It's what the MBAs think the designers do. Right? Um, but this is pretty good. What they think about is diverging and converging, uh, creating choices and making choices. But the second dimension they think about is synthesis versus analysis. So we're back to systems thinking. System thinking is about synthesis and analysis. 
and they come across this idea of divergence and convergence when trying to create the ideas. So I'm trying to blend some of these ideas together. And I got involved with the systems engineering community, and they started asking about, you know, how should we be thinking about server systems? And um, I'm going to not do this lecture for you um, too much, um, but in effect, traditionally we thought about um, there's three uh, there's three areas in which there are three approaches to philosophy that you can take. First is epistem, the theoretical knowledge. Second is technique, you take it as technique or methods. And phronesis, which is hands-on experience or values. If you're going to develop a new science, it turns out that a lot of stuff in service systems are actually things that we do already. We just don't have the theory for them. Whereas if you look at some of the other work in biology, if you look at in ecosystems, and you look in governing and policy, they kind of work in other direction. So it's kind of a checkerboard of missing sciences that need to be developed. Um, we won't, as I said, we've been working with the, uh, with the systems engineering community. We have the idea of models coming in there. The question about when you start from a mess, do you have just a qualitative? Can you actually draw things and represent them? Can you get down to the point which are computational? Can you then get quantitative? Can you get mathematical? So this is going to tie in a little bit as we start talking about um, the changes that are happening uh, inside of IBM and inside around the world as we go to cloud computing. So I've been here for talking now for 45 minutes. And yes, we are going to talk about smarter cities. Uh, you have the background. But first, we have to make an excursion through Smarter Planet. Because, you know, how did, this, how did this Smarter City stuff all come about? And I was actually there. So, uh, in the history of IBM, um, the, the decade, the 1990s, was the turnaround decade. So, I started IBM in 1985. In time to see the slide, go to the bottom, and then Lou Gerstner came in and turned the company around and came up, and uh, IBM found e business, all sort of stuff. And so, we got 2000, 2001. You now have a company that's a huge company that is financially stable. It's you know knows where to go. It's like it, it's got resources. It can do all sorts of things. What does it do? This is a, as an MBA and someone went to business school. They never tell you how to be number one in business school. They tell you how to follow a leader, but they actually don't tell you what to do if. You're leading. And at this point, IBM's got a lot of resources. What do we do? So IBM being IBM, uh, IBM has actually got the largest research institution outside of um, universities. Uh, Bell Labs used to be bigger, but then they kind of went away. So IBM has this large research thing. Uh, they have a tradition of it. And so they started what they call the Global Innovation Outlook, 2004. And you can still find these things on the web. I'm actually pulling this stuff down from uh, the Wayback Machine because they started removing them. But the idea behind the global innovation outlook was IBM was going to the customers, going to academics, going to business partners and saying, okay, we have resources, we have, you know, what can we do with the world? <laughs> and they published this report, 2004 Global Innovation Outlook, First statement, the greatest innovation in human history had little to do with tools and technology. Because people think IBM must be about technology. This is not about technology. Could be related to technology. But IBM already has a global technology outlook. And we actually work just on technologies. So this is about <coughs> innovation. What is it that is all about innovation? When we talk about the uh, wheel, the wheel is, could be the technology, but it's how you use it, right? So we start with the idea of the 21st century, that something is different in the 21st century. What's different? We must define 21st century innovation as the beginning of the intersection of invention and insight. We innovate when a new thought, technology, business model, or service actually changes society. So the idea that was going on at IBM was they were looking for society changing sorts of initiatives. This is, my friend Gary Metcalf says, that um, the interesting thing about working with IBM, because he used to work in a lot of different companies, he says, IBM only eats whales. There are things that IBM does because IBM can do them. You can't get IBM to work with a small business. It's too big. But you end up in these situations where 
you, we got really big projects, really worldwide projects, and you need a company the size of IBM and a worldwide resources in order to put it all together. So, it's not just the understanding of innovation that needs adjusting. Innovation itself is changing at least three major ways. This is the idea of the shift away from the Industrial Revolution. There's something new going on at 2004. One was the pace of innovation was accelerating. And so what they're looking at, and this was a, just looking at some technologies, um, how long did it take for these technologies to change? So you have the uh, percent penetration of, of, of world market. So it took, what, 120 years to reach peak on automobiles, right? Telephone to go all the way through. So how long did it take for PCs to get Penetration. Now you can, so cellular phones. Everyone here is young enough, I think, maybe not, but a lot of people here are young enough that you've always had a mobile phone, right? The idea that you wouldn't have a mobile phone? No. So the idea that there was innovation accelerating. The second was that innovation will require multidisciplinary approaches. Now this was a study about nanotechnology. And, uh, and what they're looking at was that in order to create these breakthroughs, you actually had to go across biology, physical laws, and, chemi and chemical properties. So the idea was that you needed to be multidisciplinary in the ways going forward. So firstly, innovation occurred more rapidly. Secondly, wider collaboration among disciplines and specialties. And the third, which no picture on, the concept of intellectual property is being re-examined in the light of collaborative demands. So this, I'm, my dissertation, the one I'm working on through this period, is actually on open sourcing while private sourcing. The idea that you could have open source communities in software and sharing, and that IBM could actually be involved with that, is something that emerged around the same time. If you went back earlier than that, the idea of open source was relatively new and we didn't have companies participating in it. But this is the period when IBM announced they were investing their billion dollars in Linux. And then recently they announced their, their second billion dollar in Linux, but they're putting a lot of money into these sorts of things. And that's related to this idea of intellectual property being changed. So, as a result of taking these types of innovations, the, stu the study focused on healthcare, governments and citizens, and the business of work and life. So that was 2004. They got a little bit of input in effect, and they thought, okay, there's these big opportunities for things to be done in healthcare, in government, and the business of work and life. What do we do about them? Do another study. 2006, the Global Innovation Outlook 2.0. At this point, now they're starting to figure out, here's the uh, table of contents, uh, there's networks, uh, there's, uh, there's small worlds going on, and, and there's um, leapfrogging going on, um, new paths of public transportation, services on the go, we're starting to feel some of this stuff, reverse supply chain network, so they're still feeling their way around big opportunities you can work on. This is from the history of IBM. Smarter Planet came out in 2008. Now 2008 was an interesting year because there was an economic downturn at that time. And what IBM came out was a campaign that says we should start having an idea about Smarter Planet and actually investing as opposed to cutting back. So 2008, the natural tendency would have been austerity. Uh, no one knows about austerity in Finland, right? Cutting back. Um, it's, it's an interesting, interesting challenge with governments cutting back these days, but in fact IBM was saying, no, you need to invest in your infrastructure and create it smarter. Now, I, I have an interesting story about this, and I only discovered this recently, and, and this will make an interesting um, side um, uh, 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 memory for you. So, I told you about all the service science stuff, and, um, and uh, Jim Spohr, who is the Director of Wellness and Services Research, so he told me when I was uh, um, walking around with him on, in December that he was um, uh, at a board meeting. He was asked to present, and IBM had 
a board meeting at uh, at Almaden, and the cadet blue jean in the next room. It's a very small, cramped room, and he's doing his pitch on service science. We do all this world economy, you know, all this changing and stuff. And generally, people are nodding, going, "Okay, okay, okay." And and then Sam, pa Sam Palmasano, who's the chairman, says, "Oh, I, I like the idea of service science, but you know, it's really not catchy. Maybe we should call it something like mm, uh, Smarter Planet." So Sam Palmasano says, "We should call it Smarter Planet." And he turns to uh, John Awada, who is the, uh, um, one of the executive vice presidents now, and says, why do I like the idea of Smarter Planet? And he says, because the initials SP are the same as Sam Palmazano. So in a perfect world, if academic researchers actually made the difference, IBM's initiative would have been called Service Science. But because it's not catchy, it became Smarter Planet. So we start off with Smarter Planet, and there's a video, this is at the uh, Council for Foreign Relations, and um, so that's Salmo Mozano, he talks about the idea about Smarter Planet. And what's the idea behind Smarter Planet? Essentially the idea behind Smarter Planet is that the unobservable becomes observable. This mantra which people in IBM started to learn, what our world is becoming instrumented, our world is becoming interconnected, and virtually all the ways, ways, processes and ways that we're working are becoming intelligent. Well, so what's that mean? Because kind of go, oh yeah, instrumented, interconnected, intelligent. And what it means is that there used to be a pre-digital infrastructure. So before the world was un in invisible, you couldn't observe stuff, and now you can. So this is creating interesting, um, it should actually change the way that you think about research methods. Because anyone that's taken the statistics course, you take a statistics course, you know, or, or a research methods course, what do you do? You go out and do market research. So you create a sample. It's like, uh-uh-uh. We have more data than we can handle coming out of a mobile device. Why would you take a sample when you can just take the universe? No more sampling. Everything is instrumented. Put a sensor on anything you want to measure and measure everything. Don't store anything because it doesn't make sense. It changes. The world changes. So don't do survey work. Do the universe. The world becomes interconnected. Analog or synchronous connections, person to person, machine to machine. So this thinks, you think about this as the internet and the web, and people initially had thought about this when people started working on like e-commerce and then you know blogs and wikis and all this sort of stuff. But what has also been happening is the standards have been changing on the machine-to-machine -machine interfaces. And so it's not just human-to-human, -human, person to person that's becoming connected, it's machine to machine. And we see this sort of idea with self-driving cars as an example. So how does a self-driving car connect to the network? Could you use your car as your Wi-Fi spot? This appears to be the, the new thing in uh, coming out of Detroit at the auto show this year, was that the, the, your automobile is the second largest thing that you own. So you have Wi-Fi in your home, once you have Wi-Fi in your car, it's got enough power, you know, you figure out how to do the connectivity, so you can have your whole network set up in the car. It's like, well, why doesn't every car have Wi-Fi in it? And then you could stop and think, well, why do you need Wi-Fi in, in every car? Why couldn't like people, if you have a parked car, why couldn't you have just Wi-Fi across all the parked cars, and then you wouldn't need to put in, you know, special, special towers and stuff like that? So there's opportunity all technology to link together. Finally, the idea of intelligent things as dumb or unresponsive to action. Before it used to be that sensors were dumb, right? Now, in effect, the price has gone down that you can actually put a computer in where you used to put a sensor in. And if you can't put it in today, there will come a day when you can put a sensor in. So what's that mean? When you put an intelligent sensor into a pipe and you're watching the pressure, almost all the time it's like, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. <laughs> nothing's happening. And in the old days, when, you were, when before the sensor got intelligent, you'd actually have to something monitor and say, anything happening? Anything happening? Anything happening? 
But now we've got it to a situation where it goes the other way, which is this thing just sits there and you kind of go, okay, I'm listening. And someone over there, uh, a sensor over there says, we got a leak. It's like, oh, okay, I'll wake up. So it changes the way that we think about technology and the way that processing is done. Computers are basically going to be practically everywhere. That's, the, that's where we're headed. Now we take that and we start getting the systems. Um, this was in, what year did I put this in? I forgot, I have to find a year on this. It's been around 2010, I believe. The I, and this is where IBM, starting from the Global Innovation Outlook, is now looking at opportunities. And what it's looking at is $54 trillion system of systems opportunities. There are big things where there are problems or opportunities. So um, you have infrastructure as a big area. You have transportation as the next area. Healthcare is big. These are all service systems, following through the way we think about services before. So IBM is looking at the opportunities in a service system perspective. And when you start lining up where the actual opportunity is, because the other one was the size of the systems, the biggest opportunities that were around were around healthcare, education, building and transportation. Ah, building and transportation. Now we're getting to the point where we're trying to talk about smarter cities. Smarter planet turns into smarter cities. So in 2009, IBM launched the Smarter Cities campaign. That's where it started. And that's the background for all of what's been happening since. But again, the idea behind this, when it comes from IBM, what's new is the idea of services, the idea of instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. In 2010, IBM citizenship, so this is a philanthropic part of IBM, to create a Smarter Cities Challenge, and there is, in effect, a contest, right? Show that your city is the smartest city. And they had various people doing that. Um, Colin Harrison, uh, they had various people doing research. Now, um, I know Colin, and, and this is an interesting sidebar, is uh, if he was working on smarter cities, <coughs> and he actually came, uh, we had been having a uh, service system science program in Tokyo, and so he was invited that one year. I'm, I'm invited again this year, so uh, in a couple of weeks I'll be going to Tokyo. Um, when I got back from that meeting, I turned on the radio. The Fukushima incident happened. He was in Tokyo during the Fukushima incident. So now you've got one of the guys at IBM Research who's now serious. Like, he was serious about smarter cities before. Now he's really serious because he was in Tokyo. He, he had a one business meeting. He stayed there one day longer than I did. Theoretically one day longer. Ended up staying like two days longer. They got the planes out. But that's why he got into smarter cities. He doesn't want to be in Tokyo when the nuclear power goes out. So we have more. Um, this is when the, uh, uh, this is actually the website today, I think, that smarter cities have gone into consulting work. There's an arm of uh, consulting that uh, you have in IBM that differentiate the research people from the consulting people. Um, and they created the Smarter Cities for Smarter Growth. So this came out of government industry. It's founded by the um, IBM Institute for Business Value, which is the consult consulting arm of IBM. Okay, so what can we do? Reduce congestion and transport systems, improve public safety by reducing crime, emergency response time, uh, services to the citizens, and uh, access to healthcare. So that was IBM's Smarter Cities initiative. That's how it got the way it got to. And that was the focus. Um, and it's pretty well been focused that way. Now, I want to talk about the cognitive era. Uh, for those of you who uh, like watching YouTube, um, this is in November. So Ginny Rometty, the chairman, um, I don't know if you, any of you actually watch stocks, um, but uh, IBM is going through one of these changes. Uh, IBM is a technology company. And uh, about the time I left the company in 2012, the IBM stock was around uh, $220. When I left the company and finished selling all my stock, I got out at 200 It went down to $120. So it's like, wow, a big change. So what's happening at IBM? We have this cognitive era coming in. Uh, and this video explains it. And, and at first you might think that it's you know just more marketing stuff, but then you actually start getting the IBM research guys involved. 
and it talks about computing, cognition, the future of knowing. And this is at the, um, the Cognitive Colloquium in San Francisco. There's a video on it. Actually, it's inter interesting to watch this. Cognitive computing refers to systems that learn at scale, reason with purpose, interact with uh, humans naturally. Do people, have people heard about the, the uh, Jeopardy machine, Watson? Q and A machine? Okay, yeah. So the idea, and this again, because I'm walking around with Jim Spore, is what if you had the Jeopardy machine in your phone? Because there will be a day when that happens, and that is where IBM is headed. It's a long way from being a mainframe hardware company. It is looking to the future where the power of the Jeopardy machine is in your phone. On Quora, someone asked the question, um, did people know that IBM bought the uh, digital assets from the weather company? And you have to ask, why would IBM buy the digital assets of the weather company? They didn't buy the broadcast stuff, but they bought all the data sources. If you could predict the weather, how much money would someone pay you? Right? This is the world that we're headed towards, and that's what IBM is betting on. So, why are the systems different? The old systems were deterministic, the new ones are probabilistic. And this is where the big shift is. So within that paper, they talk about three eras. The tabulating era, the programming era, and the cognitive era. So the programming era, we're back in the days of punch cards. US Census sort of stuff. Okay, single purpose mechanical systems, essentially there were calculators back in those days. And that was to the 1940s. And then the programming era, which is the 1980s to pretty well the modern day, where we had digital computers, if-then logic, loops. So anyone that's done any simple programming, it's a machine. And what's the value in the machine? It does the same thing every time. You program it so that it does the same thing over and over again, right? The cognitive era is now looking at man computer cooperative interaction, um, and we're looking at, um, uh, um, at how machines can help humans. And so you have to watch the language here, and, and um, some people are sloppier than others. There is cognitive computing, and there are cognitive systems. Cognitive systems include the human being in the system. Cognitive computing is the machine that supports it. But one, they want to let computers facilitate the formulative thinking as they now facilitate the solution to formulated problems. So what was the Jeopardy machine? How did the Watson machine work? What was it? Why is it different? The difference on the Watson machine, essentially the class you're talking about in computer science, these are question and answer machines. You ask it a question, and it gives you an answer. Or if you're on Jeopardy, you give it an answer, and it asks you a question. It doesn't be care, it goes both ways. But when it does that, it doesn't do that in a deterministic way. It doesn't do it with the if-then-else. It does it probabilistically. The closest way to do that, or the nearest comparison we've been talking about recently, is around um, working uh, around differential diagnosis in medicine. One of the big ideas for Watson is to work in medicine. And what will happen is that in medicine, uh, a doctor, you go into the doctor and you say, uh, I've got a cough. And now the doctor's doing the mental model and going, okay, it's probably this, it's probably that, you know, and it's probably not this. And they say, and they ask, do you have a fever? No, I don't have a fever. Uh, do you feel congested in your chest? Yes. Okay, now he's doing all the mental calculations. But what he's doing is not if then else logic. He's kind of weighing things and going, I think it's probably more of this, it's probably less of that. So that's the way that's headed. Formulating the questions as opposed to formulating the problems. Today, it, the opportunity with the new machines is that they can ask better questions. Now here's a scary proposition for professors. What are you gonna do when you have a machine that's read every journal article in the world up to the last hour and you come to class. What do you do with your students when a machine knows the journal articles better than you do? 
because that's what they're doing now on medical techs. IBM is focused on, and Watson Medical is doing that, is reading every journal article published in medicine and putting it in the question and answer format. So, you know, you go in with a, a complaint that, and, it's, and what it does, it helps the doctor. It doesn't replace the doctor, but it says, oh, it's probably, you know, oh, you think it might be cancer? Well, let me tell you about this, this is a probability. It's all these new formulas, all these new doctors, you know, all, these new, all these new treatments have come out. Oh, this new medicine came out. Did you know about that? So it changes the way the world could be. Enable managed computers to, to, to cooperate, make decisions, to controlling complex situations without inflexible dependencies on predetermined programs. It's probabilistic. <coughs> it is not deterministic. So Jim is like uh, he likes predicting stuff. So this is nice. So if we're going to a university, what does he predict that university should be teaching? So he says, in 2015 there should be a course on how to build a cognitive <laughs> system for Q and A tasks. So within universities, what they should be doing is uh, he says they spend nine months for uh, to, to build a textbook. Okay, so a textbook is. You get knowledge kind of put together, and he says in nine months you should be able to get like 40% of accuracy. So uh, compared to a student on a textbook, maybe that's not bad. Uh, if you work on it for one or two years, you get 90% accuracy, okay? Uh, 10 years from now, how to use a cognitive system to be a better professional X? At this point, it's like, you now have like a student mentor, and so this, they actually would come back and say, you know, to be a better student, um, you might not actually want to read that textbook, you might want to read this other textbook. 2035, how do you use your cognitive system to build up your own startup? Build a faculty level Q&A for a textbook in one day. So, you take out, we come to the course, and it's like, it's a, you have this machine out there, and so we need a textbook. Let the machine figure out what this year's course should be. All the new journal articles, Talk about paradigm shift, right? Anything that was like five years ago, uh, is it worth reading? I don't know, the Watson machine or one of these Q&A machines to go through and figure out, okay, this is what it should be. Most people have at least one cognitive assistant working for them. A cognitive assistant is that computer on your phone. And what they're trying to get to is that level at which it knows you better than you know yourself. It's like, you forgot to take your pill. Did you take your pill? Like, you haven't had enough sleep recently. You're pretty cranky. 2055, how to manage your workforce of cognitive assistants. Most people have 100 cognitive assistants working for them now. Okay, so at this point, you know, what, what happens is that uh, I'm, I'm trying to make a, a reservation. I think that Sari and I should probably have a, um, a luncheon together. I put my cognitive assistant in touch with her cognitive assistant. Like, we don't even talk. It's like, so, so my cognitive system gets, well, you know, well, what do you want to eat? And it's like, well, you know, uh, I don't know, she's a vegetarian? I don't know. Well, David likes Asian food. And they're kind of going back and forth, right? And they come back and the reservation. And then it says, oh, you have an appointment. Oh, I'm eating sorry for lunch. Wow, this is a great restaurant we picked, right? It's good for you, it's good for me. But that's the world we could be headed to. <laughs> and it may not be that far away. And you think that's not far away? This is a course in fall 2014 at Berkeley. Jim Sporer had this course, and uh, one of these professors to do this. The understanding was understand Watson's underlying technologies, develop a Watson um, application, value proposition. So this is actually a business proposition. Uh, get uh, some data in a domain, digest that data into the machine. Okay. Here's the idea, you have the cloud, cloud computing, you, you, you uh, enrich Watson with the content, you train it, you test the app, you deploy an application. So at Berkeley, this is how real it is, here is the um, schedule, you know, they have lectures coming in, they have a review, midpoint review. And I see I'm missing a photograph here, oh no, here's one of them, here we go. And they went to a competition. So although you're already saying, wow, you know, that sounds so far out, they had the course already last year at Berkeley. So you might want to think about that. So I'm going to wrap up a little bit. Um, I've been working on this idea of service system thinking, 
And I'm not going to talk about it so much because I'm actually recording this video and there's other videos, but uh, the video is on the web where I'm talking about it. But I'll give you a, a brief idea. How many people know Christopher Alexander? One. Oh, you guys need to do a little more reading. Um, so uh, Christopher Alexander was an architect um, at Berkeley. Uh, he created the Center for Environmental Structure. He's now like 70-some years old. He's really old. Uh, and he created this idea of a pattern language. Um, if you don't know Christopher Alexander, you might want to borrow this book out of the library, Battle for Life and Beauty of the Earth, which is kind of the gutsiest title ever. Uh, he's kind of that kind of guy. Uh, this talks about <coughs> using a pattern language in uh, constructing a, uh, a campus in, uh, for a combined high school and college in Japan. But in order to understand what was going on then, I'm going to go way back, and this is actually 1969. How many people here are architects? Oh, okay, same people that read Christopher Alexander. It's great, okay. <laughs> um, we, what is going on in architecture and what is the difference between architecture and design? What's the difference between architecture and design? So pattern language and the way they thought about it going back to the 1960s is there's this idea of problem seeking versus problem solving. Architecture was supposed to be more oriented towards problem seeking, and design was more of a problem solving and going to the solution. You can think about this in the Q&A sense, right? Um, if you know what the problem is, you can solve it. But even in the word programming is interesting. Probably programming is, pro is problem seeking. So even computer programming, when they did computer programming, Computer programming was not actually building the program. The computer programming is supposed to be defined the problem you're supposed to solve. It's actually an interesting concept, and this has kind of gotten lost over time. Now, there's two ways of approaching the problems. Um, one is teleological, where you have a goal and a purpose. The other one is ateleological, where you're looking at wholeness and harmony. The reason that we can't get rid of architects is because architects tend to work more on this side. Uh, business, business people could have worked on this side of teleology with goals and purposes. But the pattern language itself was to focus on an ateleological style of development. We have this idea of pattern language. You have a problem in a context. There are some forces you have to consider. There's a solution and a resulting context. Uh, there's a rationale for using this pattern and there are related patterns associated with it. The reason there's a pattern language is one pattern by itself you don't use, it fits in with other ideas. So one of the ideas, here's a nice one, intimacy gradient. This is a fun one. So naturally in houses, Alexander observed that there's an intimacy gradient. People will come to your house, very few people make it past the front step, front door. They're all strangers, right? They ring the doorbell, kind of go, hello, and they close the door, you know, let them in. Maybe if it's raining, you let the mailman come in because you know you have to sign for the paper or something like that. People don't make it that far. So a few people get into the hall, and then fewer people actually will make it into the living room. You have your friends come over, they make it to the living room. Um, and if the party's good, they make it to the kitchen. But very few people will make it to a bedroom. There's an intimacy gradient there where it rolls down through it, and it's a pattern that is noticed quite often. Now, the intimacy gradient is related to a lot of things. Is it like one story, two story? Is it like indoor, outdoor, the weather? These sorts of things, all these things tie together. Let's skip over a few here. Uh, it also, intimacy gradient also works in your social media. So it's a more generalizable pattern. So in this sense, if you can have it, um, some people use, I use Facebook only for my family. I use, um, People I know I want to associate with, I go to Google Plus, LinkedIn, they're different, different levels of gradient. And what we're looking at in trying to create this is unfolding wholeness. How is it that you get a situation where something feels good? You've been in a built environment and it feels natural. It's something that unfolds over time. One of the questions I have coming out from my friend David Hawk, the architect, is, is a building better on day two than it is on day one? That's an example of unfolding wholeness. I'm going to skip over the uh, slides of uh, Tokyo, Japan. 
Um, and close out. Um, I've been working on on the idea of pattern language, and the technology I've been doing it on is Federated Wiki. Um, this is a new technology. Um, it was invented by uh, Ward Cunningham. Ward Cunningham actually invented the wiki originally to support pattern language. This is Ward. Um, and Wikipedia is not what he thought wiki should be. Wikipedia has a single point of view. There's only one truth in the world. If there's an error, then it doesn't get replicated. Um, I was doing some research recently. I have to make a change in Wikipedia because um, there's uh, a, a quote that's going around um, that's being replicated, which is synergy. People have heard synergy is when the whole is more than the sum of the parts. There's actually a quote there where someone says, it's actually something other than the parts. And then when I actually started doing the research, it's actually wrong, it's, it was, that was never said. But it's actually getting cited now in journal articles and people writing up because they're going to Wikipedia, but no one has ever actually said the whole is other than the sum of the parts. They have said the whole is different from the sum of the parts. But that sort of thing that happens when you get a wiki with only one truth in the world. So Ward's been working on this idea, and I'm working on trying to do uh, the new service system thinking work on uh, a federated wiki. Um, and I've been working across the communities and going to various conferences and talking about it. So you've been listening to me for quite a while. Um, I thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks for staying. Thanks for your patience. And I'll be around for questions. Uh, I think that we may break so that people who really have to go can uh, depart and they'll be around. Is that fine? Yeah. Thank you. I think we're done. Thanks.